These beautiful female humanoid robots are rare. Here's why. The Star Wars character C-3PO is so convincingly depicted that we may have to remind ourselves that there was no real robot behind the elegant mannequin. The passage of time has not remedied this deficiency, nor alas have we a blueprint to offer. We do believe, however, by clearly distinguishing among their features, we can enrich our understanding of what it is to be human, and also, why humanoid robots are so rare. Most Striking Features Perhaps the most striking feature of C-3PO is that it's so smart. It? Yes, but don't think we weren't tempted to say he. We'll return to this temptation. Why do we think of it as smart? We see it confronted with complex situations that no one could have anticipated, and we observe it doing things and saying things that are appropriate to those situations. We will also want to insist that whatever enables our robot to act appropriately in unexpected circumstances be entirely on board, that is, encased within its titanium skin. Otherwise, it won't be humanoid. Our intelligence is something we get from what goes on within us. If we were to get detailed instructions about what to say or do via, say, a cell phone conversation, our actions would show the intelligence of the person we talk to, not our own. Our real C-3PO could look up information, just as we do, but the processes that connect that information to its actions must be internal to it. Our real C-3PO will need to have little microphones, cameras, chemical analyzers, and parts of its skin that can bend enough to detect differences in pressure. Handle with care. Robots' detectors are often called sensors, but here we must be careful. That does not mean that we could never build a robot that has sensations. It shows only that the project of building a robot with sensations is different from the project of building a robot with detectors. If we did want to build a robot with real sensations, how should we proceed? When most people are asked the question, they often respond with, why would anyone want to do that? That's a good question that reflects an understanding that robots, as we usually think of them, don't feel anything, and so can't suffer. That's why we think they're ideal for jobs that would be dangerous to people, like fixing damaged nuclear facilities. But suppose we are perverse philosophers and want to make a robot that has real sensations just to show we could do it. What should we do? The usual method of producing something is to find out what causes it, and then to bring it about by producing its cause. So, our best shot at producing real sensations in a robot would be to reproduce, in the robot's electronic parts, the same patterns of activity that take place in our neurons when we have sensations. Such a project would undoubtedly be very expensive. So, let us now suppose that in a first generation of humanoid robots, we forego it and settle for a robot that has no sensations. It does, however, have excellent detectors, and the electronic connections between its detectors, its inner processors, and its motors enable it to do what C-3PO does in Star Wars. A question that is now likely to arise is this. When it speaks, does it understand what it's saying? Obviously not. In some cases, the answer seems to be obviously not, namely, cases where it uses sensation words. So, for example, if C-3PO says, take the morphine to the sick bay, Luke is in terrible pain, we may doubt that it understands pain. If it can't feel, it has never felt a pain, and so doesn't fully understand what that word means. At best, it knows that pain, whatever that is, is something people go to great lengths to avoid. But the C-3PO of Star Wars is not like that. It utters its words appropriately. Its reports reliably correspond to what it detects, and its sentences about what it is going to do correspond to what it actually goes on to do, except, of course, when it is cleverly deceiving members of the Empire's forces. If we had a real robot of which things were true, we would take what it said seriously, which means that we would act upon what it said just as we do in response to what our fellow humans say. Disregarding C-3PO's words, treating them as mere noises, would cost us dearly, and would not be an attitude that came naturally to us. Producing Genuine Sensations But now let us imagine a second-generation robot endowed with the causal mechanisms required to produce genuine sensations. Now, we must consider the possibility of pain. Of course, it may be that it, or perhaps we should now say he, will have to suffer anyway. After all, we do sometimes call on people to endure high risks. But the possibility of pain forces us to consider a factor that's additional to repair and replacement costs. 
let us now imagine that a robot does something it shouldn't do. If we think we have a first-generation, sensationless robot, it's obvious what to do. We should send it back to the factory, just as we would a vacuum cleaner that occasionally deposited some of its sweepings on the rug. In the robot's case, it might be difficult to figure out how to fix it, but there is no alternative to making some rearrangement of its parts. But if we have a second-generation robot that has sensations, another possibility is available. We may threaten to do something that will cause it to have pain. If our threat is sufficiently credible, that may be enough to stop it from misbehaving again. And threatening may be better than sending it back to the factory, because we may not know how to rearrange its parts so that it stops misbehaving while retaining all the abilities that made it useful to begin with. But if we could endow a robot with the causes of pains, perhaps we could also build one that had the causes of other feelings, such as remorse, discouragement, or wounded pride. We can thus imagine a third-generation robot in which causes of these feelings are activated only in circumstances that would activate such causes in us. If we had such a robot, we might then influence its behavior by regularly causing it to have these unpleasant feelings when it misbehaved. A New World Now, imagine that you have lived in a world with many third-generation robots and have become quite accustomed to these more subtle kinds of interactions with them. Since these robots are smart, they'll anticipate their owners' reactions. You and your fellow humans won't have to cause robots pains or even threaten to do so very often. Most of the time, you'll just react to good and bad behavior with smiles and frowns, and most of the time, things will go reasonably well. If you can imagine such a world, you can imagine a world in which people treat the third-generation robots just like they treat human beings. If robots seriously misbehaved, you'd get angry at them. Why do we think so? Who has not kicked or swatted a car or vacuum cleaner that was not working right? We chide ourselves, of course, the kick can't be felt, and if it changes how the machine works, it will likely not be for the better. But if we kicked a third-generation robot, avoiding its head, we might not be behaving irrationally in either of these ways. The world we've just asked you to imagine is more than a world in which we treat third-generation robots in a certain way. It is a world in which it would seem quite natural and proper to do so. The consequence we are willing to draw is that third-generation robots have everything that's needed to properly ground the attitudes toward them that we usually have to our fellow human beings. But where the entire discussion falls flat is the fact that this entire process of getting to third-generation robots is quite lengthy, demanding, and comes with its own set of pros and cons. Which is why, although in existence, humanoids remain to be far and few and can appropriately be deemed rare, at least the ones worth going through all the trouble for. But it surely seems we're in for an exciting future. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.